हेलो फ्रेंड्स इन टूडेज लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द मेकेनिज्म ऑफ एक्शन ऑफ द पैराथायरॉयड हार्मोन रेगुलेशन एंड द अप्लाइड एस्पेक्ट ऑफ द पैराथायरॉयड हार्मोन एंड लास्टली वी आर जस्ट इंट्रोड्यूसिंग द विटामिन डी नाउ लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड इन दिस लेक्चर फर्स्ट थिंग फर्स्ट मेकेनिज्म ऑफ द एक्शन सो पैराथायरॉयड हार्मोन इज यूज साइक्लिक एम पी एज अ सेकेंड मैसेजर सिस्टम and if you go through my first lecture about receptor and signaling you already know what the cyclic amp messenger system and how this messenger system will work so let me give you a picture let's revise a bit see parathyroid hormone is going to use g protein coupled receptor this is the g protein coupled receptor it has a two domain one is the extracellular domain another one is the intracellular domain Once the parathyroid hormone will bind with the extracellular domain, intracellular domain gets conformational changes, and then it bind with the G protein. Now this G protein has a three subunit: alpha, beta, and gamma. Now once the parathyroid hormone bind with the cell receptor, this alpha subunit get detached from the beta and gamma subunit and become attached to the GTP, and it become energized. Once this alpha subunit get energized it will bind with this green colored adrenaline cyclase enzyme once this adrenaline cyclase get activated it convert the atp into cyclic amp now once this cyclic amp will form in a sufficient amount the it convert protein kinase into the activated protein kinase it is protein kinase a because a stands for amp now this activated protein kinase will phosphorylate the different cellular proteins and perform parathyroid hormone function what it is all about the mechanism of action cyclic amp messenger system now the second one is the regulation of the parathyroid hormone secretion the most important stimulus for parathyroid hormone release is the hypocalcemia hypocalcemia means low blood calcium level let me give you a picture whenever there is a less amount of calcium inside our circulation it will stimulate the parathyroid hormone release and this parathyroid hormone will perform its action and by its action it will increase the blood calcium level and once the blood calcium level is sufficiently high enough it will negatively feedback inhibit the parathyroid hormone secretion so high calcium will inhibit the parathyroid hormone level low calcium will stimulate the parathyroid hormone level and the second stimulus is the just opposite to the calcium is the phosphate whenever the higher amount of phosphate it will stimulate the parathyroid hormone secretion lower amount of phosphate will inhibit the parathyroid hormone secretion this is all about the regulation of the parathyroid hormone now let's discuss into the applied aspect of the parathyroid hormone starting with the first decrease in the parathyroid hormone level is the hypoparathyroidism so parathyroid gland is not secrete the sufficient amount of the parathyroid hormone what it will leads it will leads to decrease bone resorption bone do not get resorbed normally so osteoclast become almost totally inactive and this will leads to decrease calcium level because there is decrease release of calcium from the bone and ultimately there is increase sorry decrease extracellular fluid calcium level and the person will shown feature of the hypocalcemia now we already discussed what will happen in hypocalcemia let's enumerate some of the facts about the hypocalcemia when the calcium level falls to 6 to 7 mg per deciliter t10 will develop and the sign of the hypocalcemia if you guys remember i give you the mnemonic ctc first c is for the carbopedal spasm t stands for the prosuse sign C stands for Chostek sign, and the last one is the prolonged QT interval. That changes will be seen in ECG. Now, this is ab about when the calcium level is between six to seven milligram per deciliter. But what will happens when the calcium level is go below down the six milligram per deciliter? If you guys remember, there is a spasm of the laryngeal muscle, and ultimately it will lead to the obstruction to the respiration. and eventually person will die now how this parathyroid this uh, hypoparathyroidism is treated now this hypoparathyroidism is treated if you are thinking we have to give the parathyroid hormone 
but it's actually not the in uh, the case we do not uh, give the parathyroid hormone for its treatment then the reason for it it is uh, the enzyme the sorry the hormone is very expensive and it develop our, our body develop antibody against it so by the time you use this parathyroid hormone two to three times there the person's circulation has already antibody against the parathyroid hormone and prevent its action so how we treated hypoparathyroidism the answer is that we have to treat the features the main clinical features of the parathyroid hypoparathyroidism is the hypocalcemia we have to treat the hypocalcemia and if this hypocalcemia is acute then we have to give calcium and in the form of the calcium gluconate now this calcium gluconate we have to dilute it in the normal saline in the 10 milligram ratio and we have to give intravenously if this hypocalcemia is chronic then we have to just give a tablet of the calcium and it contains vitamin d this is all about the hypoparathyroidism let's discuss about hyperparathyroidism whenever there is an increased secretion of the parathyroid hormone so it has two types one is the primary and another one is the secondary so primary hyperparathyroidism is about problem related with the parathyroid gland problem lies within the parathyroid gland and secondary hyperparathyroidism there is a problem other than gland due to other any problem and the causes of the primary hyperparathyroidism is mainly the adenoma the solitary adenoma the simple single adenoma a small tumor benign tumor of the parathyroid gland second cause is the amian men syndrome now if you thinking what the men is men stands for multiple endocrine neoplasia and this men syndrome is basically two type type 1 and 2 you are going to learn this men syndrome in very detail in medicine and pathology right now just remember the cause of the primary hyperparathyroidism next one is the hpt jt syndrome now what is this hpt jt syndrome hpt means hyperparathyroidism and jt stands for jaw tumor so it's like that hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor and as far as the secondary hyperparathyroidism is concerned this increase parathyroid hormone level due to hypocalcemia now this hypocalcemia will stimulate the parathyroid gland and it will increase the parathyroid hormone main cause is the chronic kidney disease and this condition the secondary hyperparathyroidism is reversible once it is has a normal amount of calcium level once the circulation have a normal calcium level inside it now in sometimes mcq will be asked the difference between primary and secondary parathyroidism so the answer is like that in primary and secondary in both the cases there is increased parathyroid hormone level the difference is that in primary in primary hyperparathyroidism there is an increase calcium level while in case of secondary hyperparathyroidism due to it has a hypocalcemia it has a decrease calcium level and just opposite that will happen to the phosphate let enumerate it in primary hyperparathyroidism there is increase parathyroid hormone level increase calcium level and decrease phosphate level while in case of secondary hyperparathyroidism there is increase parathyroid hormone level decrease calcium level and increase phosphate level now let's discuss about the primary hyperparathyroidism parathyroidism so in this primary there will increase parathyroid hormone secretion and this parathyroid hormone first thing it will do it will increase the osteoclastic activity once there is increase osteoclastic activity osteoclast will resorb the bone in higher amount it will leads to re more release of the calcium inside the circulation and eventually it leads to increase calcium level that calcium level may reach to 12 to 15 mg per deciliter and reverse thing happens to the phosphate level there is decrease phosphate level though due to osteoclastic activity more amount of phosphate will be released along with the calcium but when both this calcium and phosphate reach to the kidney calcium get reabsorbed while on the other hand phosphate will be excreted so in primary hyperparathyroidism there is increase calcium level and decrease phosphate level now what will happens when the person suffer from hypercalcemia the effect of hypercalcemia or the clinical features of the hypercalcemia the effect is 
same as the three organ that is uh, involved in the calcium metabolism bone kidney and the git and one additional organ that you need to remember is the effect on cns we are going to discuss this in first then effect on git then effect on kidney and finally effect on bone so as far as the effect on cns is concerned the person have a depression then memory loss fatigue and finally the poor concentration these are the features of hypercalcemia on cns now as far as the effect on git is concerned the person suffer from constipation abdominal pain peptic ulcer and lack of appetite and as far as the kidney is concerned person have a renal stone now in most of the book it will be given like this that effect on cns is more commonly known as a psychiatric moans this depression memory loss fatigue and poor concentration this is collectively known as psychiatric moans and the effect of git is collectively known as abdominal groans and finally the renal stone so these are the effect of hypercalcemia or the clinical features of the hypercalcemia you guys you guys are easily remembered like did like this psychiatric moans abdominal groans and renal stones now let's discuss the last one is the effect on bone now as far as this uh, hyperparathyroidism is concerned because of higher amount of the parathyroid hormone inside the circulation osteoclastic absorption will be more as compared to osteoblastic deposition so it will leads to bone may be eaten away this is the word i taken from the gaitan bone may be eaten away and extensive decalcification will be developed and this extensive decal uh, decalcification ultimately leads to this space inside the bone and that space is filled with the fluid that is known as cyst so large cystic area will be developed inside the bone and ultimately because of this cystic area inside the bone multiple fracture can result from a very slight trauma and this fracture will be present where the cyst will develop that cyst that happens inside the bone that condition is known as cystic bone disease and in our case it is known as osteitis fibrosa cystica remember the term osteitis fibrosa cystica let me show you a picture of this uh, osteitis fibrosa cystica see in this diagram the tibia showing a cyst formation over the bone and if you see this in radiographically it will be look like this this is not the tibia actually it is a humerus but i show you the cyst how this is how the cyst will be seen inside radiography now the effect on kidney now as far as this hyperparathyroidism is concerned there are more amount of calcium and phosphate inside the plasma because of increased absorption from the git via vitamin d and increased mobilization from the bone now eventually all the calcium and phosphate goes inside the kidney and filtered and increase formation of the calcium phosphate crystal inside the urine that is the renal stone there is increased tendency to develop kidney stone and there are two type of stone that we happens actually one is the calcium oxalate and another one is the calcium phosphate and to prevent that stone the acidotic diet and acidotic drug are frequently used to treat the renal calculi now this is all about our parathyroid hormone let's get started with next hormone that is vitamin d you see the structure of the vitamin d it is more or like same as the cholesterol so vitamin d will be formed by altering the cholesterol let's discuss how to form this vitamin d how can we make a vitamin d let me give you a picture that you have uh, you guys get a beautiful idea about how the vitamin d will be formed now starting with the top this 7 dehydrocholesterol the cholesterol get dehydrated at 7 this 7 dehydrocholesterol it is actually present inside the malpighian layer of the skin and once this 
malpigeon layer of the skin will expose to the solar uv light specifically remember the this uvb light it will convert it into cholecalciferol vitamin d3 so vitamin d3 is not the actual vitamin d it is a precursor of the actual active form of vitamin d so vitamin d3 is cholecalciferol and now to convert to conversion of this 7 dehydrocholesterol to cholecalciferol you need to remember the exact wavelength of the uv light that is 280 to 320 nanometer now once this cholecalciferol will be formed it is entered inside the liver via the circulation and it will converted into calcidiol with the help of this 25 hydroxylase enzyme this 25 hydroxylase enzyme is situated inside the liver what it and ultimately once this calcidiol will form it will goes to the kidney and it will converted to 125 dihydroxy vitamin d this one is the active form of the vitamin d and to make this conversion happens there is one alpha hydroxylase enzyme is responsible and this enzyme is a, actually the rate limiting step of the vitamin d formation and the actual location of this enzyme you see kidney has a nephron and nephron has a different segment and this different segment has a different type of cell so actually where this enzyme will be situated so the answer would be at the level of proximal convoluted tubule the cell of the proximal convoluted tubule has a enzyme known as 1 alpha hydroxylase that enzyme will increase the conversion of calcidiol into calcitriol so you see in so this vitamin d is also 25 hydroxy vitamin d the calcidiol and vitamin d is also calcitriol but the active form of vitamin d is the calcitriol all right now one more thing i would like to highlight over here kidney also has a one more enzyme known as 24 hydroxylase this one is the one alpha hydroxylase the kidney also has another enzyme known as 24 hydroxylase now once our body has an enough amount of active form of vitamin d the kidney will depress this production of one alpha hydroxylase enzyme and increase the production of 24 hydroxylase enzyme and instead of 125 dihydroxy vitamin d it will form 24 25 dihydroxy vitamin d that is the inactive form of the vitamin d got it now let's talk about the regulation of the vitamin d secretion let me show you a picture of the proximal convoluted tubule cell this one is the tubular cell this one is the blood vessel again it also has a calcium sensing receptor as i told you in this csr segment that this csr is also present inside the kidney right now as i told you earlier rate limiting step of formation of the calcitriol is by one alpha hydroxylase enzyme and it is located over the proximal convoluted tubule now this conversion this rate limiting step the conversion of this active form of the vitamin d this one 125 dihydroxy vitamin d stimulated by parathyroid hormone and hypophosphatemia and it will be inhibited by calcium and calcitriol the active form of vitamin d all right so whenever there are higher amount of parathyroid hormone inside the circulation it will activate this gs pathway cyclic amp pathway and it will activate this uh, one alpha gene and make more amount of one alpha hydroxylase enzyme and make more amount of active form of vitamin d and this vitamin d will act on the gi tract mostly and whenever there are higher amount of calcium outside the circulation this calcium will we inhibit the formation of this one alpha gene and stimulate the formation of 24 hydroxylase and make inactive form of vitamin d got it now let's discuss the action of the vitamin d effect of vitamin d now as we know that the calcium metabolism will require is uh, will be happens at the three organ bone kid intestine and kidney so basically vitamin d has uh, its effect on bone intestine and kidney as well 
and vitamin D has a receptor basically located inside the nucleus so it has a intracellular intranuclear receptor and let me show you a picture this active form of vitamin D this one is the cell this one this orange color is the nucleus so this active form of vitamin D will be translocated insert or uh, diffuse inside the nucleus it will be bind with the receptor now this receptor has a two domain one that bind with the hormone another will bind with the DNA so this is known as the hormone binding domain another one is known as a DNA binding domain so the receptor by which vitamin D is going to act it has a two domain one is the hormone binding domain once the hormone bind with that domain then and then this DNA binding domain will be activated and increase the transcription of the different gene right so mutation of this receptor that is known as a VDR vitamin D receptor mutation of this vitamin D receptor will ultimately lead to the clinical condition known as vitamin D resistant rickets now what is this vitamin D resistant rickets we are going to discuss in later in our subsequent slide now starting from the first effect on the intestine the most important effect of the vitamin D is over the intestine so what vitamin D will actually do at the level of intestine it will increase calcium and phosphate absorption right so let me show you a picture of the GI lumen see this one is the luminal side this is the GI tract cell the and this one is the basolateral side over here the blood vessel is situated so this membrane is known as basolateral membrane this membrane is known as apical or luminal side of the membrane different book use different word in this case they use luminal side in some book is known as apical side now see over the lumen over here there is a gastric juice and all the um, uh, whatever the food that we ingest present over here once they are digested by digestive juice the calcium will be re the calcium will be absorbed via this channel the name of the channel is tr pv5 or 6 that's how it is written in the book the channel that transport calcium inside the cell from the lumen is tr pv5 or 6 now you already know the full form of this tr pv5 or 6 it is a transient receptor potential valinoid channel let me repeat one more time transient receptor potential veniloid channel 5 and 6 this channel will operate in a concentration gradient manner once this channel will be translocated over the luminal side it will let the calcium move along its concentration gradient and calcium will be stored inside the cell now once the calcium will be reached inside the intestinal cell this calcium will be bind with this binding protein known as cal binding cal binding 9k and make this complex calcium cal binding 9k and it will eventually decrease the actual amount of free calcium inside the cell so this gradient will be maintained and this calcium this calcium is the ionized calcium so it, it has, has a tendency to alter the cellular physiology so by binding the ionized calcium it will decrease the total amount of free calcium inside the cell so once the calcium entered inside the cell this calcium is eventually bind with the cal binding and make a calcium cal binding complex and this complex will deliver the calcium at the basolateral side to this calcium pump and this calcium pump is the ATPS pump ultimately calcium will be released inside this circulation and enter inside the blood and cal binding will return to transport new calcium and this cycle will go on and on this is the normal cycle how the calcium will be reabsorbed now what vitamin d will do in this in this cycle so first thing that vitamin will do it will increase the formation of this channel this tr pv5 or 6 there are more, it increase the number of channel that is present over the luminal side second one is it increase the this cal binding protein so there are more amount of calcium will be bind to the cal binding and it will prevent the calcium level inside the cell to rise into the dangerous level third one is this one it will increase the number of this pump calcium pump 
calcium ATP is formed and ultimately it will increase all the steps of the calcium absorption at the GI level. Now as far as this phosphate absorption is concerned if you remember our parathyroid hormone lecture this, para, uh, this phosphate is going to absorb by sodium phosphate co-transporter and inside the kidney there is a sodium phosphate 2 A and C is situated and I told you at that time that B is situated over the GI tract. So this phosphate will re is absorbed at the GIT by sodium phosphate 2 B co-transporter channel. Now effect on kidney. Now the calcium and phosphate will be reabsorbed by the renal tubule. The facility uh, vitamin D will facilitate calcium reabsorption at the proximal convoluted tubule by increasing the expression of TRPV5 expression on the proximal convoluted tubule. Now see this is the difference between the vitamin D and parathyroid hormone. See in case of the parathyroid hormone, this parathyroid hormone also increase this TRPV expression. But the location is different. This parathyroid hormone will increase this TRVP channel over here, distal tubule. While in case of vitamin D, it will increase this channel at the proximal convoluted tubule level. Right? And it will eventually decrease the excretion of the substance in the urine. So here's the thing. Listen carefully. Parathyroid hormone, it will increase calcium reabsorption and it will increase phosphate excretion while on the other hand vitamin D will increase calcium as well as phosphate reabsorption and the parathyroid hormone is also increase the secretion of vitamin D. So what would be the final result over calcium and phosphate concentration? The answer is that once the parathyroid hormone is higher inside the circulation though this parathyroid hormone is increase the vitamin D secretion but ultimately finally this calcium will be reabsorbed and phosphate will be secreted inside the urine because the effect of vitamin D over the kidney is very weak. So the absorption of the phosphate, reabsorption of the phosphate via vitamin D is counteracted by phosphate excretion by a parathyroid hormone. Got it? So ultimately there are more amount of calcium inside the circulation and lower amount of phosphate inside the circulation. All right. Now effect on bone. Now what is the effect of vitamin D over the bone? See vitamin D is have a receptor over the osteoblast. So vitamin D is going to increase the activity of osteoblast. It will stimulate the osteoblast and via different cytokines it will has a secondary effect on osteoclast secondarily it will increase the activity of osteoclast so vitamin d has a capacity to do both the thing it will also increase bone formation it will also have the capacity to increase bone resorption now when bone formation will increase when bone resorption will increase that will be depend on the quantities of the vitamin d inside the circulation if there are a quantity of vitamin D is extreme inside the circulation, it will increase bone resorption. If the quantity in a smaller amount, then it will increase in bone calcification. Now let's discuss the interaction of parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. So here's the thing. Whenever there is a decreased plasma calcium level, it will lead to increase parathyroid hormone secretion it will stimulate the parathyroid gland and will increase the parathyroid hormone now this parathyroid hormone has the effect on bone kidney and GIT let's discuss one by one this increased parathyroid hormone once it act, act on bone it will mobilize the calcium from the bone and it will eventually increase the plasma calcium level in kidney it will increase the renal tubular calcium reabsorption so it will decrease the calcium excretion and also parathyroid hormone will increase the activation of vitamin D and this vitamin D eventually enter inside the intestine and increase the calcium absorption so ultimately the final result is increased calcium level inside the plasma so whenever there is a decrease plasma calcium it will increase the parathyroid hormone as I told you earlier the plasma calcium and parathyroid hormone are even in inversely related 
so whenever there is a decrease plasma calcium level that will ultimately increase the parathyroid hormone and eventually parathyroid hormone will decrease calcium excretion increase absorption at the level of intestine and increase mobilization of calcium from the bone and the final result is increased plasma calcium level all right this is all about our today's lecture in our last lecture we are going to discuss about the applied aspect of the vitamin d and the last hormone calcitonin thank you